After a long and unique offseason, the Wolverines are about to report for voluntary workouts on June 15th. We'll assess the state of the football program next on Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it, Nip Cook. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Collinger at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Mount Robinson and Michigan. Winner. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Greetings. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. I'm Steve Dace for the first time this season. We're going to be joined by my partners, Brandon Brown and Michael Spath of Wolverine Digest coming up in the next segment. We're going to look at the top questions facing the Michigan football program heading into the start of workouts and then a six-week camp that will probably begin sometime around mid to late July. That's right. College football is here. And after much doubt, thanks to the coronavirus pandemic, it is going to happen. And maybe that has something to do with what I'm about to say next. Because is it just me? Or is this the, the least amount of buzz and hype we've had for a Michigan football team since Jim Harbaugh took over? Now, there's always hype and buzz for a Michigan football season. I mean, this is the winningest program of all time, one of the greatest traditions ever, a classic blue blood that also has the largest living alumni base in the world and one of the largest fan bases in the entire sport. So there's there's plenty of interest and excitement out there for the season itself, but there's not really a lot of buzz for this team. It, it, it seems as if, and maybe I'm wrong, you let me know in the comments section or follow me on Twitter at Michigan Podcast and, um, and you can ping me there. But it seems like the media, the college football intelligentsia, and, and frankly, even most Michigan fans kind of agree on the same narrative. That the Wolverines are mired in some form of a lukewarm hell destined to be nine and three forever. Jim Harbaugh is basically Michigan's Earl Bruce, another favorite son who came home uh, to bail the program out during a historic low spot after Woody Hayes' slugging incident in the 1978 Gator Bowl and um, and just went like nine and three after, after a great first season. He then went nine and three every year, pretty much. Old nine and three Earl was his name. It, there's a sense that that's what the program is now under Jim Harbaugh, that it's it's too good to make any moves to take that risk that you'll you know take a step back, see that as the Rich Rod era, but it's not good enough to go where I think everybody that uh, believes in the Block M as I do thought the program was going to go and, and was destined to go under Jim Harbaugh, that there was no other viable alternative other than we're going all the way. Except after five years, I think more and more people are thinking we're not. 
And they're not all mem members of clickbait media. I think this is true even among a lot of other Michigan fans. I think this is why we're having the debate about what about graduation rates? What about activism? What about uh, contributions to the community? I mean, those things are all important. No one's buying a contributions to the community t-shirt at the MDEN, right? No, no one's buying a high APR hoodie at the MDEN. No, they're not hanging banners for that at Chrysler or at, uh, at the big house. So we're looking for added value, ancillary value to compensate for the lack of the value, the lack of value with what we value most. And if you just look at a year ago at this time, Michigan was the consensus pick to win the big 10 mainly because urban Meyer was stepping aside. Michigan had the senior quarterback back was so close in 2018. This would be, this would be the defining year that would get Jim Harbaugh and Michigan over the hump. Instead, they suffered arguably an even more humiliating loss to Ohio state this time at home, then another bowl game loss and bada bing, bada boom, just like every previous season under Jim Harbaugh, three losses or more at the end of the year again. And I, if you look at what the preseason magazines are saying now, I mean, they're just basically rating Michigan blindly, you know, somewhere between 12th and 15th and just saying, hey, we know they're going nine and three. That's what they do. And, you know, they're pretty good. They're just not relevant. So who knows? Maybe this will be the year now that most Michigan fans have grown resigned to our fate. Most of the college football intelligentsia has decided it's not even worth clickbaiting Michigan anymore. It's too much low lying fruit. Maybe this is the year when a bunch of people aren't watching, paying attention, or don't think it'll happen, that this is finally the year Michigan defies those expectations and finally reaches the summit we all thought they would reach at least once, if not repeatedly, when Jim Harbaugh was made the head coach. I'm not counting on it by any stretch, but we have seen it before in college football. Arguably, we just saw it with LSU last season. So that brings us to the state of the program as it heads into the 2020 campaign. We'll discuss that and break it down with my partners over at Wolverine Digest, Michael Spath and Brandon Brown next. Want to thank all of you who have been supporting us on Patreon these last few years here on Michigan Podcast. And for those of you that ask us every now and then, hey, what can we do to help uh, support what you guys are doing and help it to grow. Well, supporting us on Patreon is a big way you can do that. Patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. And as you can see, when you become a $5 a month uh, subscriber and supporter or more, you get uh, as well exclusive content that we publish just for you on our Patreon page, including a lot of the stuff that I do with sports handicapping as legalization goes wider throughout the country. In fact, you can see uh, I put up just a couple of weeks ago uh, the notes uh, for NFL win totals, looking at the schedule release. So a lot more where that came from. If you want to support us at patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Back here on Michigan Podcast, and now with the team set to report on Monday the 15th, the college football season is here. After a long and peculiar offseason, every program has some unique challenges to face. That includes, of course, the Michigan Wolverines. Joining me now from Wolverine Digest is Brandon Brown. We're going to take a look, Brandon. Uh, first of all, welcome to Michigan Podcast. We're going to take a look at what I think are the top five questions facing the program heading into the 2020 season coming off one of the more unique and peculiar off seasons. And we're going to let you answer those questions. You ready to go? Ready to go. Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Uh, the number one question I think that has to be answered here and every program has to answer this question. We, we just had the most unique off season since we had teams like Iowa pre-flight in the world war two era where guys were coming and going from the military. And that's thanks to COVID-19 Michigan has, I think the largest weight room in the country, like a lot of top college football programs, state of the art nutrition, as well as strength and conditioning. These guys all went through winter conditioning, but for the last several months, they they have not had contact in person with that staff or with Michigan's equipment, with Michigan's nutrition, et cetera, largely relying on whatever it is they can emulate at home. So what is the collective condition of the players? What, what condition are they in, Brandon? Your thoughts on that question that every program is going to answer this month. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any way you can – It's it's got to be worse or less or whatever. Whatever word you want to use, then it would be if things were normal. But – 
I mean, these are, these are high level athletes, 18, 19, 20 year old kids. I, I don't think there's going to be as big of a drop as it may seem. I mean, I remember what I was like when I was 20 and I certainly wasn't a Michigan football player. Um, so I, I think, I think, yeah, you're going to have some guys, you know, where maybe if, if guys have had a weight issue in the past, that might be a bigger concern, but I, you know, a, a large majority of these guys are going to be in pretty good shape. I think, uh, I think it's going to take some time to get the the conditioning back up, the endurance, the football shape. But I don't really see like a huge drop off. And, and like you said, it's going to be everybody. So it's not like any, it's not like some teams are going to be head and shoulders above the others because they were able to get back and start working out sooner. Or, you know, they were have, able to have these private work. I mean, everybody's in the same boat. So I do think it's going to be a collective step back from where it would be had they all been together all, all spring and throughout the summer. But I, I really don't think it's going to like be noticeable on the field. I just don't. I mean, when you're talking about the, the level of condition that these kids are in, you know, the physiques that they have, the, the age that they are, I mean, they, they bounce back pretty quick. I remember, you know, talking to, uh, to Chris Hutchinson, Aiden last year during a game got banged up or something. I can't remember exactly what the injury was or what happened. And then the next day he was like out in the yard, like, out in the out in the driveway like playing basketball or something and and Chris said like oh man to be nine to be 19 again like he doesn't even feel it the next day you know where somebody like me in my 30s or anybody out there in their 40s or 50s like that puts you down for the count for a week so I I really don't think it's going to be that big of a deal it's going to be not not ideal not as good as where it maybe could have been but everybody's dealing with it and these are pretty young guys I think they're going to be just fine real quick can you think of a specific position group or position battle or player where this physical conditioning issue could potentially impact who, who starts there week one or the battle itself from a conditioning standpoint, somebody coming off an injury, a rehab, somebody that needed some development there where we could get a surprise spot starter in week one, because these conditions kind of put somebody either ahead or behind where they might normally be. Like for example, yeah, I mean, I, a year ago with an Ambry Thomas overcoming Crohn's disease, if he if he didn't have you know regular access to the nutrition department and everything at Michigan, there's no way he's available to play week one without that direct coordination, right? So, is there anything like that where you can think of somebody who this may impact their availability or help their ability to to climb the depth chart? I mean, I think I think you could look at all the big boys, right? All the linemen, the offensive linemen, the interior defensive linemen, the guys who are pushing 300, 320 pounds where weight could be an issue. You know, you get guys in, you know, especially the young guys, Chris Hinton, Mozzie Smith, who are just starting to shape their bodies after a year of being at Michigan. Uh, I know Mozzie is somebody specifically who has dealt with a, you know, weight problem. Not not a problem, but he came to Michigan heavier than he needed to be. They got started getting him into shape, started trimming him down. And now he's been gone for several months. You wonder how a guy like that looks coming back. And that's a guy that Michigan's going to need. I mean, they need depth at defensive tackle, and he's listed as the heaviest defensive lineman they've got, just a sophomore. Um, so, so he's one that immediately popped in my mind. And then, you know, a guy like Andrew Stuber, who was coming off the torn ACL. Mm-hmm. You wonder what you know. You wonder where he's at. He's. I would. I would assume most people think he'll probably start somewhere on the offensive line. But you wonder you know, how his knee is feeling, how his strength and conditioning is, you know, did he, has he been compensating for the other side, you know, all along because he's favoring that, that injured knee, which is something they try to correct and keep, keep from happening if you're on campus. So those are the two, I mean, there's a guy on each side of the ball right there that I think are easy answers. You look at a guy like Mozzie Smith, who's going to be called upon and has dealt with weight issues in the past and, and then Stuber coming off the injury. But I think it's all the big fellas. I mean, you've got guys, you know, like a Ryan Hayes, who was slight and slender coming in, did he lose some strength and bulk that maybe he needed? So I, I think it goes both ways. you got guys that you want to put on weight and get bigger and stronger, and you've got guys who you'd like to trim down a little bit. And, you know, being away from school for all this time is going to have the adverse effects uh, in both directions. All right, question two that I think Michigan's got to answer uh, here as we assess the state of the program. How much ground can a young offensive line make up in a short period of time after a lack of off-season reps. So 
95 offensive line starts go out the door for Michigan. That's what happens when you have four guys drafted into the NFL. By my count, Michigan's returning 17 offensive line starts on this year's unit uh, or, or projected unit. And since the, the guys if, that would back them up, that may beat them out, don't have any starts, that's the number. And 13 of them are from just one guy in Jalen Mayfield. Now, Ed Warner is one of the best in the business, but this is a lot of time and technique away from a line that has to hit the ground running on the road at Washington if that game is played as scheduled. I mean, that's a team that has a lot of question marks, but probably the strength of their team is their defensive front. So what do you think? Yeah, that's that's... That's a tall task. I mean, Ed Warner, I've said this in a couple different ways and a couple different stories I've written. I do think he is one of the best, but he is going to earn his paycheck this year because that is, that's not a spot guys want to be in. And I know Josh Gaddis recently met with the media and he said, well, we feel good about that unit. We feel like we've got three starters coming back. Well, you just, you just outlined it. There's 13 starts in Jalen Mayfield. That means there's four for Stuber and Ryan Hayes. So that that's not a lot. That is not a lot of starts for the other guys and, potentially could see Stuber playing a position that he hasn't even started at before. So it's tough, man. It really is tough. We have no idea who's going to play one of the guard spots. We have no idea who's going to play center. I mean, if I had to guess right now, I would say Mayfield and Hayes got the tackle spots locked up. And then you find, you find a spot for Stuber because he's, he's got the size, he's got the strength and he's got some experience, but he is coming off the injury. Can he move to guard? I mean, there's a lot of question marks with that unit and it's, going to be going to be tasked with protecting a new quarterback so it, it is I mean Josh Gaddis can say they feel good about it all they want but I bet Ed Warner is probably thinking something slightly different in his head he's really really good at his job and they, they do have some talented young guys but it, it that is a that is a tall order for any offensive line coach and uh yeah I, I he he's definitely going to be He's definitely going to be having some long nights at the office, I'm sure, this season leading up to the to that first game, especially because you, you don't even have any tune-ups to get ready. I mean, you're going mm-hmm. on the road against Washington uh, right out of the gate, so you've got to have the best five out there and hope that they can figure it out. Question three, Brandon, as we assess where the program is now with players about to report, how has the time off impacted the quarterback race? They had different ways of, of prepping. Joe Milton stayed in town, worked with former Michigan quarterback Devin Gardner. Dylan McCaffrey, of course, with his parents' uh, NFL background, did a lot of work at home. Cade McNamara, everybody associated with the program, has made a point of of bringing him up, a very prolific prep quarterback out of Nevada a couple of years ago. And g- given the one attribute that we know he has from his high school days is accuracy, and that's kind of the big knock on Milton and McCaffrey, despite their overall athleticism and size, you know, in a year where you don't have much offseason, maybe that does help him make up a lot of ground because they don't have as big of an advantage in that area as they would have had in a normal year. So how has this time off impacted this vital quarterback race? Yeah, this is an, I mean, when you've got O-line questions and quarterback questions like Michigan does, especially given this year's off season, that's, that's not the best spot in the world to be in. I, I, I think it's, I mean, we see this every year a little bit, like when there's a battle at a position, like the coaches will always mention a third or fourth guy where you're like, the guy's not going to play. Come on coach. Like what? And I kind of feel like that's what's going on with Cade McNamara. I mean, I'm not knocking him. I have I've another never, theory of what they're play. doing with him, which is I think there's maybe an anticipation that whoever between Milton and McCaffrey loses that job is going to transfer. So you might as well okay. uh, get McNamara in. It, you know, he's going to be the backup by default, maybe anyway. So you might as well get people used to hearing his name. That's another theory that I have, maybe where that's concerned. But go ahead. Yeah, that I mean, that certainly makes sense. And I, this is something that hasn't been talked about, and I think I brought it up once or twice during the season last year, but when you're talking about a true freshman quarterback who's not going to play anyways, it doesn't get a lot of attention. I'm pretty certain that Cade McNamara had a pretty severe knee injury last year. I saw him in the press box on massive crutches with a knee brace that went from his ankle to almost his hip. Like hmm. I'm talking like ACL, hyperextended knee type of injury. Now, I'm I don't want to speculate or start some big controversy because this was a long time ago. He'd be healthy by now. But if that is the case, that means he missed a lot of time last year as yeah. well. So I per, personally, I just don't see him as being much of a factor. I think it's all Milton, all McCaffrey, but your point makes sense because probably one of those guys is going to win the job. And then what does the other guy do? Um, but yeah, back to your original question. I think it's huge. I mean, it's, you, you missed all of spring, you missed all of spring ball. You didn't get to have those practices. You didn't get to have the game like experience. I mean, that's not, that's not much like a game, but you know, in the big house in front of some fans, actually doing some live, some live action a little bit. You didn't get any of that. 
But like you said, we saw Joe Milton working out with, with uh, Devin Gardner and throwing to Ronnie Bell. That certainly is a good idea. Um, D- uh, Dylan McCaffrey is going to get as good of tutelage and coaching as anybody in the country, given his, his background and who his parents are and what kind of family they've got. So they're obviously working hard. They want the job. That's really all you can ask for in this type of situation where they haven't been able to, to be with the team or be with the guys they're going to be thrown to on a day-to-day basis. But it's, it's huge. I mean, when you think about other good Big Ten teams who have a returning starter coming back, like Ohio State with Justin Fields, like Penn State with Sean Clifford, I mean, that's a massive leg up compared to what Michigan is dealing with. So, I mean, those are, like I said, you, those are positions you don't want to be in when you're replacing four starters on the O-line and trying to figure out who your quarterback is and you haven't even seen everybody in the same building yet. It is it is very, very much so less than ideal. Question number two, as we take a look at what needs to be answered now that players are about to report, and once they do, this is going to feel like, you know, the downhill of a roller coaster. It's going to be kickoff in 10 minutes. That's That's what's going to happen with all this going on now all at once. Or question four, I should say, with extra time off, what new wrinkles did a staff with three current former defensive coordinators come up with? Brian Jean-Marie at, at South Florida, yeah, his defenses weren't statistically great, except in one area, creating turnovers. They were very good at that, and that's something that Don Brown's defense has not done a, a great job of at Michigan. Bob Shoup's considered one of the best defensive coordinators in the country, too, and was a finalist for the Frank Broyles Award uh, just back in 2018. So alongside Don Brown, that's a lot of time for these guys to tinker, get their heads together, because we're really talking about a couple of games on the schedule, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you take a couple of games away from the schedule, Don Brown's one of the best defensive coordinators Michigan's ever had. It just so happens that those couple of games are the most important ones and and they have face planted. Mm-hmm. So just the la- in the last couple of years. But I got to believe they've done an awful lot of tinkering with all that available time. What are your thoughts? I mean, that's they better be. I mean, that's what I would say. I mean, what else are you doing right now? Like you said, you've got all this time, you've got all this knowledge, and you've got all this experience among those three guys. Um yeah, it should be, I mean, I, I don't know if I want to throw percentages on it, but what, I mean, three quarters of the time looking at the teams that are as good as you on paper, you know, the, the Ohio States, the Penn States, the Wisconsin, and like, that's it. I mean, like, Don Brown's going to go out and put a defense out there that can shut down Maryland, that can shut down Rutgers, that can shut down Purdue without even trying. I mean, in most cases, I mean, you would see some weird upsets every year, but like, he beats up on those teams. Michigan beats up on those teams. And then, like you said, face plant is, Probably too kind of a term, if we're being honest, Steve. But <laughs> you've got to figure something out. You've got to figure something out against Ohio State, against Alabama, uh, you know, against in these bowl games that Michigan has been losing the last handful of years. It's it's those Wisconsin on the road last year, Penn State on the road, uh, at least in the first half. It's it just can't happen. I mean, it, it can't happen if you want to be in the discussion for the Big Ten, in the discussion for the playoffs. You've got to be able to handle those teams. Uh, that are that are as good or better than you talent wise, and Michigan only faces a couple of those a year. Mm-hmm. So it really does just come down to a couple of games every single season. And so far, those have been losses, and because Michigan's been giving up too many points. Um, I, I would, I mean, man, just you bringing up that that thought. I would lo- that might be that might be where I would want to sit in the most of anything that's going on with Michigan football this off season and heading into the year in that defensive war room where you can see Don Brown and Bob, uh, Bob Shoup and Brian Jean Marie just bouncing ideas off each other, scheming things, looking at certain specific plays. How did this beat us? Why did this beat us? What can we do? Man, talk about a clinic. I would love to see it. And yeah, hopefully that's what they've been doing a lot. You know, whether it's, I don't know if the coaches have been meeting in person or not, it would seem like that might be acceptable to get three or four coaches in the room together. But, uh, I would I would certainly hope that a lot of their time and energy has been going into exactly that. Final question, Brandon, as players get set to report on the 15th, how did all the time away either help or hurt establishing a culture of accountability and leadership within the team? This was a big theme at the end of last year. Ambry Thomas sounded off about this like three seconds after the bull loss, said, hey, there was a lack of accountability here. We all remember the stories of, of Shea Patterson golfing too much last offseason and Josh Gaddis's concern about that. The whole uh, fracas about uh, Shea Patterson not being voted a captain and then Jim Harbaugh stepping in and awarding him an alternate captain instead. We heard for, about players from Tariq Black to Michael Dwumfor. How bad are they really 
really hurt? Are they sitting out? Donovan Peoples-Jones in there too, because uh, who's calling OBJ? Are they sitting out because of their NFL draft stock? Our own Michael Spath wrote a, a pretty uh, scathing column about this back in January, the the lack of a selfless culture within Michigan football. Uh, that that was supposed to be a big emphasis this offseason. I'm sure the players have been talking amongst themselves, but, but developing that leadership, that accountability, that esprit de corps, and then doing it with an uncertain quarterback position, because that's one of the key leadership positions on the team. I think that's, that's a huge question mark uh, as we get started with the, the players reporting on Monday. Yeah, it is. And I think you, you right, right as I was getting ready to, to think of my first sentence, the quarterback thing popped into my head. You don't have a guy who's going to lead your team, lead your offense in place yet. But I think both of the guys, Dylan McCaffrey and Joe Milton, have a have a strong sense of leadership about them. They just kind of carry and conduct themselves that way. Um, you know, Shea Patterson always came off to me on the surface as a pretty decent leader, you know, a heady guy pretty calm, pretty unflappable, but we heard some stuff that went on behind the scenes that was not ideal. Uh, and you just, you just listed a couple of them talking about the golfing thing and that maybe some of his teammates weren't the biggest fan and that maybe some other teammates wanted other guys to get a shot. I mean, we heard about that all year. We heard about that after the season and I, I can't think of anything negative, honestly. And that's not trying to be hyperbolic here or get everybody's hopes up for what's going to happen with the quarterback situation, but I cannot think of anything negative about either of these guys, like at all, like they're well liked by their teammates. They're both hard workers. They both have a quiet confidence about them. They both, I mean, physically, they just, they look the part. I mean, that's kind of a weird thing, but I think it's, I think that's legitimate when you've got a guy that's six, five, that's going to stand in your huddle and going to command the huddle versus someone who's six foot or six one. I think that does actually play a part. They just, they just feel, they feel a little bit more like someone that you'd go to war with. And, and I think that's good. But again, not being together with everybody, you're going to have some natural device, natural division. Um, you know, if Ronnie Bell has been working out all off season with Joe Milton, like right. how does he feel about Dylan McCaffrey? Right. I mean, it, it, not even intentionally, but like, it can't be the same. So yeah, that is a really interesting dynamic. And I don't know. There's like, there's no way to measure that. I mean, you're not going to know that until you see it on the field or you mm-hmm. start hearing about it at practices or we start getting these media availabilities. Like there, that's a, that's completely, you know, immeasurable, you know, it's intangible. It's not, not real, but you, there, how do you know, how do you know that even the coaches, like they probably don't even know, like, what are we going to get? What are we going to get when we come back? Who's going to step up? Who's going to be a leader? I think you can immediately look to a couple of guys like Aiden Hutchinson, Quiddy Pay, Ambry Thomas, very competitive, um, fiery guys, especially Thomas and Hutchinson. They're going to be outspoken. They're going to take control of that defense. Brad Hawkins, another leader back there. Joshua Ross has captain-like you know, personality traits. So they've got some guys who I think will wrangle in everybody else even after being away for so long. But that is... That is a massive question mark because you've got to get everybody on the same page. And when you haven't been together, it's only natural that some little clicks are going to form. And they're probably that probably happens when they are together. But it, it, it seems to me like it would be amplified when they're when they're apart. Brandon, real quick, is there anything I didn't bring up in these questions that you think also has to be addressed as players get set to report on the fifteenth? Not really. I mean, there's a couple specific things that I keep coming back to. I mean, I'm so curious to see how Josh Gaddis looks as a second year offensive coordinator. Cause he was much better down the stretch. I mean, I, this might be a personal one just because I covered him since I think he was in ninth grade. I'm, I'm so intrigued by Chris Evans return. I really am. I just, I can't wait to see how he's used. I, I mean, if he ends up standing on the sidelines, most of the time, I'll be pretty disappointed and really kind of surprised, honestly, because I feel like he's tailor made for Josh Gaddis's offense. Mm-hmm. And then the freshmen, you know, the young guys who are, who are you going to see, um, that, that are brand new or maybe second year players, guys that we haven't really seen on the field yet, just who's going to step up because there are some every year and you need those guys. And especially this year, cause there's just not that many upperclassmen that are going to start and play a lot. It's going to be a lot of young guys, and a lot of new faces. So I'm intrigued to see, uh, you know, see the young guns who, who gets out there and who starts making some plays. Well, the other issue you're going to have too, and every program is going to face this as well, who tests positive for coronavirus and has to sit out for 14 yeah. days to make sure they're not symptomatic, right? That's that's going to happen. We've got a lot higher numbers of asymptomatic cases than we knew about in March, which is actually good news if you know how viruses operate. But that also means then if, fewer, if, if, if more people are getting infected, you've got to have uh, maybe extra precautions. You're seeing a handful of guys at every program when they come back are testing positive. So that could be an issue too. That, that'll be 
something to watch as well. It's Brandon, good stuff, man. Thanks for joining us this week on Michigan Podcast. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Good stuff. You bet. Wolverine Digest is where you want to go each day to stay up to date on everything we think is going on with the Michigan Wolverines. And what we love about our site is it's an analysis and opinion driven site. So we don't rely on access in order to get information. We rely on analysis and it's all free at WolverineDigest.com. You can get all the great content we put up there for you each and every day at WolverineDigest.com. This week's Twitter poll result, we asked you, do you think Michigan will open the college football season at Washington as originally scheduled or against someone else? Two to one odds. This audience thinks they're going to open in Seattle at Washington. 64% say in Seattle against the Huskies, 36% someone else. I would have reversed this about a month ago. Uh, but it looks like the momentum now is in favor of Michigan playing that game at Washington to open the season. That brings us to our question of the week this week here on Wolverine Digest from Tim Nesterak, who says, Michigan returns a lot of skill talent, but am I wrong to be concerned about both lines? Uh, Tim, I don't think you need to be concerned about the defensive line. I think this is going to be one of the better defensive lines in the Big Ten. When you look at the pairing on the edge with Aiden Hutchinson and Quiddy Pay. That's as good coming back as there is in college football. And there's plenty of depth behind those guys as well. And then I think I think players like, you know, former five-star recruits, uh, Chris Hinton, Mozzie Smith on the interior at the defensive tackle position. I think with another year of development, they're they're going to be ready to contribute more this year. Uh, you, you also have other returnees there on the defensive front. Maybe this is the year a Donovan Jeter puts everything together. Carlo Kemp could be a team captain on the defensive front this year. So I think the defense defensive front is going to be fine and is loaded with depth and talent. Um, I'm concerned about the offensive line. Now, Michigan is recruited as well there as any team in the country the last few years, but we just watched 95 offensive line starts go out the door at Schembechler Hall thanks to the NFL draft. By my count, we are returning only 17 offensive line starts from last year or in their careers, and I believe 13 of those are from one player. Jalen Mayfield. So there's a lot of work to do there. A lot of talent. Ed Warner's one of the best in the business on that side of the ball too, but not having an off season to get all those guys ready that, that you could be asking a lot for them to go into Husky stadium on the road on the other side of the country and, and just be a cohesive unit from the get go here to start the season. So I'm much more concerned about the offensive line than I am the defensive line. Well, what do you think? You can let us know by following us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. You can comment on our content at WolverineDigest.com as well. That's a great place to keep up to date with our takes on things in between episodes. We will be back again in two weeks because by then we'll have more news on scheduling and player evaluations with workouts now fully underway. Until then, don't forget, Like, rate, and subscribe, whether it's YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, however you access us here at Michigan Podcast, and keep telling all the Michigan fans you know about what what we are doing here as well. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace saying Go Blue.